Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Today we're talking about copyright. Our guest is Tom W. Bell, professor at the Chapman University School of Law and author of a new book, Intellectual Privilege. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thank you. Thanks for having me. The term intellectual property makes it sound like copyrights and patents and so on are just forms of property like anything else. But you don't you don't agree with that. Um, and so you think that there's it's something there's something wrong with thinking about them in the same way that we typically use the term property. Yes, I think it's a, a misnomer. It's got some truth to it, but it's apt to mislead people. Uh, it's apt to mislead policymakers, and I think uh, that's part of the reason why copyright has gotten far too big. And big in the sense of too many, or too many laws, too many regulations, too long, maybe all of the above. I don't know if there's too many copyrights. I, I would say there are uh, the too many privileges granted to copyright holders. They they have too much power, and it includes term, but it's other things too. The scope of the rights that they can command at law have gotten too broad. And uh, those – traditionally copyright requires a few things to, to obtain one under under legal. What, what does that usually require? Under US law, it's uh, basically any fixed expression of authorship that's original. And authorship here doesn't mean writing a book. It can be a computer program, a painting. It's any creative expression. As long as it's recorded in a tangible medium and it's original, you have a copyright. Then what makes this sort of thing different from – property as we typically use that term when I'm talking about like my car or my house. Yeah, I do think property – we have property rights and it's a wonderful thing. In fact, that's one reason I'm a little um, concerned about the word being overextended with regard to copyright. Um, th the problem is basically that copyright is fundamentally different from those tangible types of property in a number of ways. Uh, one way is that copyright originates only in a federal statute. It's a government-granted privilege, kind of like a taxi medallion or welfare benefits versus our property rights in tangibles which exist in a state of nature, I would argue, and uh, exist at the common law. And you can't say that of copyright. It doesn't exist in a state of nature and it's not recognized at common law. And uh, because of those factors, uh, some people, some libertarians actually believe that there should – there is no such thing as intellectual property uh, in a in – a, in a True world. Now, you you think that there there should be they're not against copyright as a privilege. That's right. I I, I wouldn't advocate abolishing copyright simply from the um, argument that it's a privilege. If you think the federal government should do anything, there's a good argument for having it uh, support copyrights. At least it's in the Constitution, which is more than you can say about much of what the federal government does. So there are people who doubt that we should even have a federal government. <laughs> if you don't <laughs> think we should, you're not going to like copyright. But to the extent you think what the federal government does is justified or can be justified if it's done constitutionally, then I think you can find something to like in, in copyright. You say that copyright or intellectual property doesn't exist in the state of nature. It's not the kind of property uh, and that, that that's why we should stop necessarily thinking of it in the same way and think of it more as a privilege. But is it that it doesn't exist in the state of nature because say the technology to have this sort of thing didn't exist? So Presumably something like sculpture or painting could exist in the state of nature because you could make these things and then there's this object that you could claim a property right in. But songwriting or books or whatever else, the other things and a lot of things that we typically think of when we talk about copyright couldn't have existed simply because there was no way to even make these sort of things. So, so did, did the property get created then because – you know, so now we have a technology to make books or whatever. So now there's a property in it. Well, I think to to answer that, we have to uh, we have to describe what's special about copyright. It's not the works themselves. Humans are inherently creative. They've been creating songs, I suppose, even before they were humans. Right? Birds create songs and ditto paintings and and other things that we protect with copyright. No, the the problem isn't the creation of those expressions. It's how you grant people powers to control what other people do with them. So in a state of nature, suppose I come up with a song. I'm living in a tribal society. There's no federal government, nothing like it. And I come up with an original song and you like my song and you start singing it. I really don't have any way to stop you, not practically. 
you know, I can complain, but, you know, our neighbors hear the song, they like it too, they all start singing it. There's just no mechanism. You say technology and I suppose if you think of social institutions as a form of technology, yes, I'd say there's no technology. Trevor Well, I'm also thinking the technology of fixing this thing into – so we didn't, we didn't have writing in the state of nature. So there couldn't be written works. Well, I guess if you go back far enough and you deal with a primitive enough creature, that's true. There's no fixation. Uh, but I don't think that's really the pro – that's not the problem with copyright. In the Renaissance, for example, they had plenty of ways to fix works, you know, musical notation, painting, sculptures in marble. And even there, I would say you have the same arguments to regard copyright as a privilege as you have today and as you had with the caves at uh, Lascaux, I mean, <laughs> where they had paintings on the walls. Trevor So in the uh, Constitution, as you mentioned, um, you kind of uh, imply a little bit there's a freedom limiting aspect to this. If if you have a claim, you can't sing the song that I just sung, type of thing, which I think applies to Happy Birthday. If that's yes. unless it's apocryphal, um, uh, but I hear that a lot. And uh, as you mentioned today, when you're speaking earlier, the Martin Luther King's speech is not something that you could legally go onto the sidewalk and start reciting uh, to the point of actually being penalized for it. So that seems a little bit problematic from a freedom standpoint. Would you agree? I do. That's one of my concerns with, with copyright is it does limit uh, specifically our freedoms of expression but more generally uh, our freedoms to use our property rights intangibles as we see fit. You know, you're saying to me I can't use my throat in this way. I can't use my guitar, my printing press and that's what copyright does. Trevor Burrus In the constitution, there is a little bit of a, of a proviso about why the copyright is allowed? It says to promote the useful, useful arts and uh, that is promote the useful arts and sciences. I believe is the actual yes. terminology. Yes. Uh, and does that limit the clause? Do you think in some way? Well, it doesn't under current jurisprudence. Effectively, the Supreme Court has said, well, they've made it a dead letter. They don't see any constraint in that 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 I've been able to discern from their jurisprudence. I think it is there for a reason and it should limit what lawmakers can constitutionally do. I'm one guy talking but the words are there for a reason, I figure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, in your new book, you have copyrighted it or tried to under the 1790 Copyright Act. Which you uh, call the framers. The founders, founders. The founders, founders copyright. Yeah. So you tell us what that is? Sure. And what's um, neat about it? Yeah. Well, basically the same parties who ratified the Constitution in the first Congress passed the first copyright law, the 1790 Copyright Act, right? Constitution 1789 next year, the first Copyright Act. And so I think what they did in that act tells us a lot about what the founders thought about the proper scope of copyright. And when you compare the 79 Copyright Act to our present act, wow, it's a huge difference. The maximum term, for example, was 28 years. It forbade only exact duplications of works. It didn't forbid derivative works and in a number of other ways. It was much more modest than what we have now and that appeals to me. I mean I, I really admire the founders and I thought it would be a good idea since I think copyright today has gone so far. When I was figuring out, well, how much copyright should we have? I thought, well, you could do worse than to go back to what the founders had. So yes, we've released the book. It's essentially under a public license that is designed to replicate insofar as possible the 1790 Copyright Act. So the copyright will expire – well, certainly in 28 years. It might actually expire earlier than that for reasons I could get into. And if you want to create a musical of my book, I will not be able to stop you. I've already said you know, it's up for grabs and in other ways it's – designed to recreate the, that historical uh, model. Trevor Burrus And that is not what copyright looks like now in the sense that copyright is a little bit more um, well, rent-seeking in some way you discuss. What does Mickey Mouse have to do with current, current property or copyright law? Well, yes. Uh, copyright is fundamentally based on a federal statute and we all know what happens when you have federal lawmakers together with lobbyists. They seem to push federal powers always towards more and more and more. It's a big part of what Cato does is <laughs> noting that and, and trying to resist that and so too with regard to copyright. The 1790 Copyright Act, as I said, was 28 years maximum. Now the maximum term could be well, it depends on the kind of work but usually it's life of the author plus 70 years or really you know, death of the author plus 70 years and that could easily get you over 100 years uh, or for certain types of works, it's 120 years maximum. It's, it's a lot longer than it used to be and that is uh, I think indisputably the result of lobbying. Now, I don't want to point to the Disney company as the only lobbyist. In fact, I don't think anybody's able to prove it's that you know, Disney ever lobbied anybody for an extended copyright term, but it wouldn't surprise me if they did. We have this graph oh, yes, showing, graph, yeah. showing as 
– I mean it's pretty remarkable how much it syncs up that as Mickey Mouse gets <laughs> awfully close to public domain, suddenly the term of copyright shoots up and it happens over and over again. Yeah, the book, which I encourage your listeners to purchase and download. And, um, it's make a, musicals of too. <laughs> make musicals of. <laughs> no charge for that. Um, yeah, the book has a number of charts and graphs and I put them in there because I do think they illustrate these things so nicely and neatly. And so what one of those charts shows is that uh, Steamboat Willie created in and first published in 1928 initially only had a maximum term of 56 years. And as that term started running out, the 76 Copyright Act kicked in very conveniently. And this is this is the cartoon where Mickey Mouse is yeah, first. Yeah, Steamboat Willie was where Mickey Mouse's character was introduced. And um, there's an aside about that we could get into where it turns out probably Steamboat Willie is actually not copyright protected. But but Disney treats it like it is and they have a lot of attorneys and nobody wants to mess with Disney. So, so, so it started getting close to expiration and lo and behold, 1976, the new Copyright Act issues and and the term of then existing copyrights were extended. So they said, you know, here – Disney, here's another 20 or so years on your copyright term. Well, thank you very much. I'll take that. And then it started getting close to expiration again in 1998. And lo and behold, here comes the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act, which extended it again. And now it's slated to expire sometime before 2030. I think it's something like 2024, 20, 26. Well, we don't know what's going to happen, but <laughs> past practice indicates it looks like Steamboat Willie might get pulled out of the fire again. And this is one of the reasons why – you talk a lot about the common law as being preferential in many ways to these statutory schemes which not only allow for certain types of rent seeking and special interests but but and, and therefore shift at a more constant rate possibly than than looking at the common law. Can we talk a little bit about what the common law is in this regard and, and how they viewed copyright if they viewed it at all in, in that way? Well, I should observe up front that you know some scholars disagree with me on this. I want to be fair to my counterparts. Uh, there's a lot of debate about a lot of things in copyright, but I think the best argument is that the copyright didn't really uh, that common law did not recognize copyright. And what is a common law? It's basically the decisions of various courts on various issues. So it's a very decentralized, bottom-up system. No one court says in the common law system, "I'm setting down the law for everybody, everywhere, for all time." That's what legislators do. That's a very top-down process, legislation. The common law just has a judge says, in this dispute, I'm settling this dispute between these two parties. This is the right thing for them. As to other parties, it's merely precedent. And another court has a similar dispute and it makes a different decision. Another court has a similar dispute and it makes the same decision. And over time, in the aggregate, we can see out of these many different decisions as sort of an epiphenomenon, the rule kind of arising. And so it's a very different process. It's a spontaneous order. Uh, your, your listeners might be familiar with that term. It's a, the common law is a spontaneous order that arises from the bottom up versus this planned order, statutory law from the top down. And that has a number of policy impacts. I think one reason copyright has gotten so big is because it's centralized. There's a place to go to lobby for more of it and that's what happens. In the common law, you, there's nobody to, to lobby. <laughs> you know, you just have these courts that you go take your dispute to. I'm imagining someone listening to that and thinking that from what you've described, sure, we you know we don't end run into the problem of one body upping the terms kind of arbitrarily to perhaps help out Disney. But at the same time, there seems to be maybe a lack of certainty present in there because you said you know one court makes this decision and it may be precedent and other courts may then follow it, but other, but some may not. And so someone's saying, look, that doesn't sound necessarily better because as an author, you know, I'm, I may dedicate the next 10 years to writing this book and I want to know how long I'm going to be able to sell it before someone else can just run off their own copies. And now you're telling me some judge could just make up a number and there's, there's no kind of higher authority or another judge could change his mind the next time. That's an excellent observation and um, there's a couple of things to say about that. One is a lot of commentators conclude from your very, very apt analysis that we need a little of both. We need a common law system and once in a while the legislature has to step in and maybe kind of uh, decide one way or the other or kind of clarify some, some obscurity. Uh, other commentators and I lean more in this camp say, well, we don't need necessarily legislatures to do that. It is enough that uh, – People like academics and scholars look at these common law decisions and say, 
after many observations, is an empirical process. We've concluded that most courts resolve the issue this way. And so that allows you to turn to these commentators, things like the restatements of law or commentators like Bracton or, or Cook or others, sort of scholars who've studied a lot of common law systems. We go to them and figure out what the rule is. And the third thing I'll say is, well, you know, to some degree <laughs> – we should stop having courts uh, uh, innovate in the common law. The idea with the common law, the thing that really charms me about it is if you stick to the big three, I've taught all three of these classes, property, contracts and torts, there's really just a few simple rules. A few simple rules are all that you need to make a society work well. In fact, Richard Epstein you know, wrote a book along with – I think he called it a few simple rules or something. And the idea is that is that with just a few simple rules – you can solve most of your questions that way. So you have a question about duplicating somebody's song. Under common law, you ask not did a court create a, co a common law copyright somewhere. You ask, well, can we solve this problem using contract law and property law? Did, did he steal your piece of paper? No. Well, I don't see a property violation. Did you have an agreement with the person that you say stole your work? No. Oh, no, co there's no contract claim, and you're left with tort, and you know we just kind of run through the really relatively few causes of action. No cause of action. You say tough nuts. Why don't you go use a contract next time? Why don't you lock it in a box so you have a property claim? And the argument I'd make is really those few simple rules will suffice to create a very complicated, rich, prosperous, culturally uh, variegated society. I want to follow up on some of that but it raised I think an interesting distinction that you <clears throat> have brought up when you say you know it's did he take your piece of paper or you can lock it in a box one of the things that seem that's different is this non-rivalrous nature of intellectual property to other property can you explain what you mean by that Sure yes that's a fundamental distinction between copyright and what I'm willing to consider property, non-rivalry in consumption. And Thomas Jefferson described this in his beautiful quote where he described an idea as like a lighted taper by which he meant candle and a single candle can illuminate the whole world. So your candle's lit and you can touch your neighbor's candle and light it and ditto down the line. Their illumination in no way takes away from yours and that's the way copyright is too. If you come up with a beautiful song and you sing it and I hear it and I sing along, we both have a beautiful song. That's wonderful. It's magical. One of the things I like about copyright is it does seem to encourage the production of those wonderful uh, sources of wealth as, a, as opposed, of course, to tangible property. You know, If I eat an apple, you can't eat the same apple. It's rivalrous in consumption. So fundamentally at an economic level, it's almost like a law of physics. Copyright is different from other types of property and I think public policy should, t should take that into account. I think one of the ways that people think it when they're talking about it being as property and so there's theft of it is not so much you know if i steal the song that you wrote from you it's not that you can't continue to enjoy that song i'm not taking your ability to sing it but instead one of the things that we can do with property is sell it we can transfer it to other people in exchange for something and if i take your song then suddenly i can transfer it to other people or if i promulgate it enough i can take away your not ability but the possibility of a market in your goods. So I've taken – it's it's that ability to use property to make money that we see as being stolen as opposed to the, the thing which obviously can't because it's not tangible. Yeah. The same point came up in the forum earlier today we had here at Cato and it comes up very often in these discussions and well, there's two things I'll say to that. One is that can't be an argument in and of itself for copyright. Really all that is an argument for is – Someone wants more money than they're getting <laughs> and this institution lets them get that money. But that doesn't tell us whether or not they should get the money. So the second point is we have to ask, is this a place where we want to give somebody an exclusive right so they can say, when you do that, you're infringing because I don't get to make as much money on it as I'd like? Well, that's a question of fact and there are reasons to say – I mean I'm willing to concede that there are reasons for copyright. There's reasons to worry that an author, for example, she sits down at her typewriter and she's got the idea for the great American novel in her head and she starts typing and in a world without copyright, she might stop. She might say, oh my goodness, I don't want to complete this because well, the first person to read it is going to run off with it and I'll never make any money and we lose out. We don't get the great American novel. So it's a good reason for copyright but at the same time, we have to recognize that every time we enforce copyright, we are in some way restricting the possibility of someone to enjoy something for free. Now, that's a gift. That's a wonderful thing. You have to say to the person who wants to make their copy, 
Ordinarily, you'd be able to do this at basically zero marginal cost. There's nothing in the rules of physics that says you have to pay for this. It's like magic. But we're going to impose this law and you prevent you from doing that. And that's an opportunity cost. The question for us should be, given we want this good outcome, the new expressive work, is it worth bearing the cost of restricting people's liberty? And that's exactly the question we need to ask. There's not an easy answer, but it's the right question. The wrong question with copyright is to say, well, it's property. Shouldn't we stop people from stealing property? That's way too simple. That's one reason I think it's important to think about it as a privilege because it puts us in to the right frame of mind to address these questions. How would we go about trying to answer those? Uh, one of the big ones here would be term, correct? Um, 14 years uh, is going to maybe give someone more but less incentive than 70 years. Uh, maybe you wouldn't write the great American novel if uh, if you don't think your, your kids can reap any benefits from it or anything like that. Could we ever use anything to try and figure out what the proper term of a, of a copyright should be? Well, you know, I write about this in the book. People talk about copyright uh, being in a delicate balance. They say copyright delicately balances public and private interests and I think that's absolutely absurd for two reasons. One is it presumes we have the numbers to do the calculations. I think people have this picture uh, as if in The Wizard of Oz, you know, there's a scene where Toto pulls back the curtain and you see The Wizard of Oz is actually – he's a charlatan. But this, you know, big control panel, and he's manipulating things. And they think of lawmakers like that. Like lawmakers are, you know, they're turning this this public utility dial just so, and they're they're adding a little bit of derivative rights just because they want to balance it out. Well, there's no numbers for that. There's there's no control panel. It's a few lobbyists who happen to get the ears of a few legislators. And secondly, even if they had the numbers, they wouldn't really care. Because that's just not the way the legislative process works. So you ask me, well, then how do we find the numbers? Well, a couple of things. One is we should look for salient disasters where we say, oh my gosh, nobody's writing novels or we don't have enough sculptures or there's just way too few of them. And if we see that, then there's reason to say, well, let's try something. And uh, we should also, on the other hand, look for salient examples of where copyright has gone very much too far, when people are being thrown in jail, and this has happened, for taking a few seconds of, of a recording on their, their, their cell phone in a movie theater because you now you – know, every cell phone is a recording device. It's very easy to record almost incidentally you know, a bit of a movie and that's a federal offense. You can be thrown in jail for that. Now, when people are getting thrown in jail for that, I think we have reason to say, wow, that's – that's maybe too much or the fact that if I were to sing happy birthday, if I would have sung that in the forum today, as I mentioned, I could potentially be liable for $150,000 in statutory damages for singing a short little song in a crowd of like 60 people. Well, that's a bit much. So we can look for these salient examples of where there's obviously not enough protection. I don't think we're in that world in any way or there's obviously too, mu too many restrictions and I think we can argue we're in that world. It also seems though that you – if you would be willing to – maybe concede that there – maybe the optimal thing is having no copyright whatsoever. If the – because you get a lot of benefits from that too. A, a classic example being modern hip-hop music uh, which has moved away from being a sample-based artistic form because of the kind of copyright claims that you, you've been making. And I do think it would be a weird question to try and weigh the – you know, the subjective value of all this hip hop music against the subjective cost of all these people. So maybe the best well, solution. Well, and then there's the but then there's the possibility that if there hadn't been copyright around, you wouldn't have had the original the, music, the stuff for them to be working with in the first place. But maybe we shouldn't be trying to tilt the levers at all, in the sense of just saying this isn't property, no copyright whatsoever. Well, you know, there are whole areas of our economy where effectively there's no intellectual property protection at all. Uh, for example, jokes, recipes, perfumes. Uh, designs, designs of furniture, yeah. designs, designs of cars and now in all these areas. So there's no way there. You come up with the best new perfume ever. There's really no way to stop someone else from copying the smell. Do we lack for innovation in perfumes or jokes or recipes in these other areas? We do not and I think that's highly suggestive. I don't know if that answers every question. There's a few areas where even, you know, where even I, a copyright skeptic, worry. If, for example, Hollywood had no copyrights, would they create, you know, those Huge blockbuster Avenger films? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe big software projects like say Halo. Wow, a lot of person hours went into Halo and people get a lot of utility out of playing that game. And if you could just make a copy like that, I worry it would never happen. But I do think – and this is the final sort of my, my overarching answer to this. I do think we should encourage a system where people have an incentive to try. Uh, 
They have an incentive to try to do without copyright because right now you're given copyright automatically even if you don't need it. And so everyone – it's too easy on people who want to create business models and, and sell creative works. They just say, well, I got my federal rights. I can sue the bejesus out of anybody I want. So they never look into the possibility of using technical protections or business models or licensing schemes or other common law-based ways of solving these problems without running the risk of statutory failure. People talk about market failure. Copyright's a statutory failure. So in the book, I describe some ways we could just with tinkering of a few little statutory provisions, create a system where copyright is more open, where people have an incentive to exit the copyright system and kind of stand on their own two feet in the common law system and do there what the Copyright Act does for them. Can we already say like contract around copyright? I'm thinking of things like the Creative Commons licenses that were – at least a big deal a few years ago. Aren't those an attempt to say I'm going to create a new system of copyright or set of rules for how this is going to be used and put it out into the world? Does that not work? Does it get trumped by federal legislation? Well, it is true you can forego some of your statutory privileges. Indeed, as, as you noted, I've done that with the book. I've uh, said I'm not going to take everything I can. But you know, what's my incentive for doing that? I'm kind of a quirky guy. Uh, uh, not many people are going to follow me in that. Did it with the Creative Commons. I'm a big supporter of what they do. And they do make it easier for people who want to kind of take a more minimalist approach, a less restrictive approach to, to, to do that. But there's very few incentives to do that. It's just it takes – I, I won't say a hero but a certain kind of person who's you know, got different incentives and interests. Those people are very rare. So I don't think that's enough. I think we also need to implement reforms that give people a little bit more of a push out the door. It's a little bit like everyone's sheltered under copyright now. And sure, the doors are there, but there's no reason to go outside. So the idea is we need to open up those doors and say to people once in a while, you know, we're going to nudge you over there. You know, try stepping outside for a little bit. It doesn't work. Maybe you can come back in. But right now, people don't have much of an incentive to try something less. What sort of incentives? I mean, what sort of benefits? would flow to someone who opted for a less restrictive system? Well, one of the proposals uh, I've set forth in the book is uh, Section 301G if you want to look for that. And basically what it says is it reassures people that if they want to rely solely on their common law rights, contracts, uh, technical protections which would be protected under tort or property rights, federal law will not strike those down as interfering with copyright. Now, there's some risk now that that could happen. So I believe there might be a disincentive at the margin for some innovators where they say, well, look, I don't, I don't want to try to go the common law route solely because I'm worried it will be struck down as preempted by federal statute. Whereas with this system, if someone came up with, say, say a technical protection that could potentially last forever, then they might say, wow, that's even better than copyright. So I want to try that. It's actually worth more money to me than copyright. And I'd say, uh, good, try it, please, because now you're not going to be going to Congress and lobbying for more protections. You're going to be standing on your own. If you put your work in the public domain, we'll let you do as much as you can with the common law. So that's one innovation. It does give an incentive. I won't pretend it's a huge one, but it's a step in the right direction. It gives an incentive for people to say, I'm going to try doing without copyright because for me, it could be better than copyright. In terms of the technical – uh, innovation you're talking about, do you mean like a DRM, a digital rights or what do you mean in terms of uh, – I was unclear on an example of what you were talking about. Sure. That would be one example. Um, also, uh, there's some people doing some exciting stuff with regard to smart contracts and uh, uh, micropayments. Bitcoin is especially well implemented for this. There's been proposals for systems under which you could use Bitcoin to make – very low transaction cost um, uh, sales of basically access to copyrighted works. Like for every second you're listening to a song, a little tiny bit of money is going to the artist's pocket. And this is done merely as a matter of protocol. It's not because you have some, you know, a lawmaker who passed a statute and some attorney who negotiated a license. It's just built into the system. In a world like that, it's not clear to me you need copyright, and we may even be able to structure it so you don't even want copyright. Well, the interesting thing that that, that brings up, uh, which is one of these sort of uh, copyright. Skeptical viewpoints, and even for patents, is that if you have the state here protecting the parameters of, of your right, uh, then you're not innovating to protect the parameters of your right. And this, of course, happens in many areas. The FCC came in and protected the parameters of radio licenses, so they never had to figure out a way to lock their own licenses down, their own radio bandwidth down. But all these things, such as DRM or any other way of trying to 
getting getting people into the movie theater is another good example. Uh, when as soon as they started filming movies and and pirating them, the movie companies went to 3D and everything else to try and get people into the theater, and they because they couldn't stop these people from doing that. So is that another argument against copyright uh, that, that it's stopping a certain type of technical innovation to protect your own works? It is. I like that observation. I'm a, I have a lot of faith in human nature and in freedom both. And I like to draw the analogy between uh, packet switching and the common law. So the, the beauty of the internet is it's a packet switch network. As with common law, it's just a few simple rules. You take your message, you break it into packets and you basically throw the packets into the cloud. And how do they get to the intended recipient? Basically, routers direct the packet through the cloud. And each router, you know, just has it's just a few simple rules. This this packet has this address on it, the router passes it on to the next router. It's as opposed to as if it's technical, you'll have to excuse me, but I do think the analogy holds up. As opposed to a circuit switched network, such as we use for landline telephone. In which case, you know, there's a central system. AT&T connects you and you have a dedicated line between the East Coast and the West Coast to do your phone call. That's like legislation. And as the internet shows, when you have a distributed system with a lot of simple rules with easy access, you get unforeseeably wonderful things happen that never happened under the circuit switch network. And so that's how I see the common law. It's kind of like – the internet is like a, the, the TCP/IP, the protocol that runs the internet. That's what those few simple rules of common law are like. On this technology, so we're talking about now about how copyrights can stop technological innovation, but at the same time, you've argued that technological innovation can make copyright less necessary in the first place. Copyrights yes. are becoming, I think, less important than they used to be. I think that's true. Yes, I definitely argue that in the book. Um, I'm not sure that's the point you're making, though. I think, I mean, I'm willing to. to I, I definitely believe technology makes copyrights superfluous in a lot of areas, but I think you're making a slightly different point. No, I think I'm arguing that the the importance or the importance of copyright so far as like we need this thing in order to protect people's creative work so that they will create because if they're not protected, they won't. Technology has made it less important that we have these legal protections in order to facilitate creation. Yes, yes. Uh, the ex examples I like to use – well, there's a number of examples we could use. But think of music. I mean back in the – say the 1950s, for you to get your pop single out to the world was really expensive. The recording studio was expensive. The distribution network was – it had to move atoms around. Imagine trucks with LPs that broke. Really expensive. And so someone like Elvis Presley could not do it on his own. Whereas today, if you're a budding artist and a musician, you get a laptop, internet connection, you have instant access to the whole world. You got studio grade recording facilities right there in your laptop, and boom. And so in that kind of world, you can be a hobbyist. Elvis Presley could be a hobbyist and enrich our lives. Now, well, you have to wonder would Elvis be as rich? And our conclusion might be he would not be as rich. And to me, that's a red herring because copyright is not about helping artists in the final analysis. That is the means to the end. The end is making us better off with lots of expressive works. And if people are willing to do it as hobbyists – Which they obviously are. Which they obviously are. That's right. Then that's everything we want from copyright. But you see artists and, and, and composers and people kind of bemoaning this. I, I heard Bette Midler the other day saying it's really hard. She seemed to think it was unfair and I'm sure to her it seems unfair because she grew up and worked in a system where there are stars and they're coddled and they make a lot of money. But you know, Bette Miller and people like her basically are being pushed out of the market by amateurs who actually keep us just as happy for a lot cheaper. For us, that's a win. <laughs> Well, that really underscores the privilege part because, yes. because so <laughs> Bette, Miller is, Bette Miller is complaining that, that someone who does it for free is, uh, get, is making – taking money away from other people. And so it's sort of like the taxi cab medallion that Uber, Uber comes in or, or people giving ride shares and Lyft and things like that are taking money away from the established people who have been giving a certain type of property right? So it's an interesting observation. It's a great it still idea. is the case. I mean even back – at the time of Elvis or when Bette Mittler was making all of her money, there were lots and lots of people who were hobbyists simply because they couldn't make any money doing this anyway, just like there are today. I mean this, but there they were lots of musicians but, but yeah. the difference is now those people can have an audience at least whereas right. before they couldn't even have that. It's actually better all around because in the old days, you know, like if you were someone who loved music, you realized, you know, I just really don't have a shot. I'm not that good at it. And now, you know, you can find the maybe 15 or 20 people in the world who just love your music and you're not going to have the audience but their lives are better, your lives are better. The only people who lose out are people like Bette Midler and she's made plenty of money so my heart really doesn't go out to her much. <laughs> uh, let's go from the other side. Um, 
which is the copyright should be perpetual and enforced to the hilt. Because there's this other element too where, where it seems to me that there's a moral case for, for copyright. And if you came straight in sort of a Lockean type of idea that you get property, you get property in land because you put your effort into it and produce something usually valuable, then if you do the same thing with sitting down with a bunch of paper in front of you and you produce The Shining or Stephen King, then then you also just because of a moral case deserve to have that claim. And in that situation, it seems like it should be not limited at all. You should have that claim forever uh, as much at least as the same way that land property is is not similarly limited. How would you feel about an argument such as that? Trevor Burrus Well, I agree that's uh, an argument for copyright that I've heard made. Uh, and some libertarians I really respect have that view, Lysander Spooner, Ayn Rand and others. So I think it deserves some credence but I think there's some serious problems with it. Uh, first of all, Locke himself – this is kind of an argument from irony – did not claim copyright in any of the works that people roll out in justification of this point of view. Trevor Burrus That is pretty ironic. Trevor <laughs> It is ironic. And I've heard people say Locke supported – in fact, uh, one of the commentators today said as much in our book forum that Locke supported copyright. I've looked through Locke and I've never seen that. In fact, he said some things about the copyright of his day, the stationer's company, which were highly critical. So I'm skeptical of that. What else? What other problems are there? Well, let's keep in mind copyright is fundamentally different from land and other tangibles in that it's non-rivalrous in consumption. You're doing something very different when you give somebody a copyright than you are when you recognize their property rights in acorns or land that they improve. And here's another problem. The, the borders on copyright are very fuzzy and this just makes it difficult to get property rights to work well. It's one thing to say, you know, you have the copyright in your novel. Maybe that would work if we stuck to the 1790 Copyright Act, which only forbade exact duplications. But, you know, uh, Stephen King is going to say, I have the movie rights as well. And also, you can't do a cartoon based on it. Oh, and your novel actually is a little too much like my novel. You seem to have borrowed the character. It's very fuzzy borders and we get in these terrible fights that don't happen with tangible property. Tangible property, you say, uh, there's my fence. <laughs> this side's mine. That side's yours. Very easy to figure out. These acorns are mine. I collected them. Your acorns are over there. So there's other things I could say and I will add that me personally, I'm not – I don't regard Locke's arguments for property as the best arguments for property. You can be a libertarian and say, eh, that's like a third tier kind of argument for property. That's my view. I prefer Hayek's approach to property. So there's plenty of room for other libertarian uh, defenses of property that don't raise these problems. Well, let me push back a little bit because it seems like uh, land – property and land is, is not as clear as you would say. I mean we have things like adverse possession where you have to pay attention to your land for some period of time. How long should that be? You know, 18 or 21 years, statutory period. All these things, how high above your land do you own? How – you know, rules of perpetuities, all these things that are also fuzzy around the border. So I'm not sure – we're always choosing these rules in real property usually to produce economic efficiency and we could do that in, in copyright too possibly. Are we doing the same thing with copyright and real property? Trevor Burrus Well, I, I mean that's, that's good, good arguing. I like that. Uh, let's admit that there's always fuzzy borders in the law. I often have students show up at law school and they're very quickly disabused of the notion that it's like playing Monopoly. You, know, you turn over the, the lid of the box and there are the rules and you read them and you're done. <laughs> Everything's contestable. But I do think it's a question of degree. Uh, most copyright disputes that you see litigated are basically these boundary disputes. It happens all the time. About the only time it doesn't happen is when someone like a pirate just does exact copies of something. But those aren't the typical th things that get litigated. I mean those guys, when they get caught, they know they're guilty. They get thrown in jail or they plea bargain. It's all the interesting cases are people fussing over boundaries. When you look at case law in property, that's not where people fuss. They fuss about you know other things, typically you know title, but I mean I'll just say it's a question of degree. Copyright is much more fuzzy than real property and I'd say real property is even fuzzier than property rights intangibles. We don't have all these many complicated doctrines like oh, you know, use of frux and easements with regard to chattel property, you know, simple things like computers, cars and such. So it's a question of degree, good point, but I don't think it really saves copyright because it's so far out there on the fuzzy side. You mentioned that so Stephen King we have this He's got. He's written this book, but now he's claiming these rights to lock down derivative works, including movies and whatnot. And I'm wondering. So, if we say that you know property rights, even in real property, are at the start grounded in some sort of moral claims that we have, you know, whether it's a locky and I've mixed my labor with it or whatever, we have this moral claim that then the law is coming in and codifying and enforcing. Um, 
but it seems like there's there's an intuition that authors have would have similar sorts of moral claims in, say, derivative works. That you know, so HBO right now is making a bundle of money and getting all sorts of people off this Game of Thrones TV series, which are based on a set of books, and the author of it is presumably being well paid by HBO because they weren't allowed to make this series without it. But if derivative works are kind of fair game, then HBO could have just seen these books, thought that would make a pretty good series and just turned them into scripts and shot them and made you know, millions, tens of millions of dollars. And it feels like there would be something morally wrong with that if they, they didn't even ask permission and they certainly aren't paying the author. And the author, I mean, could be poor to begin with and the novels didn't sell very well. And now we're just saying tough. You don't have any claim over that sort of thing? There's a couple of things to say there. Those are things to worry about. And I would agree that authors have moral claims in circumstances like that. I don't think it should follow automatically that they should therefore have legal claims. And you might say, well, well, that's wonderful. So they get to scold, you know, HBO, but that's it. Well, I would say that in fact, uh, experience has taught us that in a world without copyright, because Everyone seems to sense these moral concerns. It actually ends up at after you have some evolution of social institutions really making a difference. Uh, this fellow Spoo wrote a book called Without Copyright and he has this uh, wonderful historical account of how copyright worked in the United States in a certain period of its history when foreign authors basically had no copyright protections. So you would think that you know you bring Dickens' work over here to America on a fast boat and you can make as many copies as you want. Did that happen? No, actually it didn't. It turns out publishers, because they understood and their readers cared about these moral arguments, worked out these kind of um, – I guess I'd call them quasi-legal institutions. They certainly didn't lean on the copyright to solve all their problems. Instead, they used things like gentlemen's agreements, uh, first publication contracts. Uh, authors would used to include in books. They would put in a statement saying this is the, the – in return for royalties, they'd say this is the authorized edition. And you as a fan of Dickens would want that book. Why? Because you have the same moral sense. You say, I love this man's work. He makes me weep. He makes me laugh. I want him to be rewarded. Also, I have reassurance that this is the legit deal. It's not some guy named Dickens who's actually from Australia you know, who writes rubbish. So institutions arise – that satisfy our, I think, quite sound moral sentiments, even in the absence of copyright. I think copyright's a little bit of a bullying approach. It's a subtle problem. I mean, we can say of HBO, did they not contribute a lot to this guy's book? So they certainly did. Well, then HBO deserves something too. Copyright just comes in and says, give that guy a veto, and he can squeeze HBO as hard as he wants because of some kind of maybe moral sentiment. I think in the real world, we should have a more sophisticated, gentle, kind of uh, uh, evolved approach to these things. That's the flip side where you think about uh, – libertarians have to do this a lot. It's not just George R. R. Martin might seemingly get a little bit robbed here. But then you have someone like uh, uh, J.K. Rowling or who, who, who puts the kibosh and says no one can do anything, no one can do fanfic. I think that that's I think she's done that, yeah. or someone else who yeah. says else who so. So you give the author the control over this, and they can they can keep anyone from making a show like Game of Thrones and enriching our lives because they have complete bullying control over it. So and it, that's the problem where we have to think about. The world that it does not exist and how people would behave, but as your point is well taken, if we have the moral sense that and I think most of us do that George R. R. Martin deserves something from Game of Thrones, even in the absence of his ability to control that, then people would contribute to that in some way. Yeah, I think here, Trevor, we should use the same arguments that we use with regard to charity. You know, people come against libertarianism and they say, "Oh, you're not going to have any kind of charity." I go, no, actually, I think charity is really important. I contribute to my local United Way. I, you know, help people when I can. Well, but you're not going to make people do that. No, because it's ethical. I think people will do the right thing. This is the same kind of response to copyright. Is that a guarantee? I suppose if we got rid of, you know, all the welfare programs run by the state, you know, there's a possibility everyone would say, oh, good, I don't have to do anything with regard to the poor anymore. I just have more faith in human nature. I think enough people, maybe more, would say, I'm going to step up to the plate because it's just the right thing to do. It's a very different approach. So you're saying that an author who has poured years into writing this novel has no Lockean claim to it? I wouldn't put it that way. I would say they have mixed their labor with the paper that they're writing on. And so they own that piece of paper. Just like you go out in nature and you collect acorns, you own those acorns. Now, of course, you will probably respond that that's not creating copyright. And I would agree because if you take a photo of that piece of paper, you don't take the atoms, you can run away with that. 
But it's the, gen- the genesis, the germ of what could be something like a copyright-like protection because if you own that piece of paper and we defend that, that's, those are atoms. It's property. You can lock it in a box or you can, you can lock it in a box and then say to someone, I'm only going to open this box for you if you agree to my contract and in the contract, you agree to pay me a license and you agree to pay me if you create a, a movie based on my book. Now, it's true that if the wind blows away the piece of paper and someone else picks it up and they're not under contract, it's going to be hard to stop them. But with technological protections, you can pretty much make sure the contract always sticks to that, you know, in effect, the piece of paper. The idea is we can use common law rights and the locking arguments if we have institutions that, you know, adapt to the common law world that create something very much like copyright but without the statute. And then also some things like trade secrets and tra- and trademarks can be which can be used, which are often called. Uh, one of the four types of intellectual property, the other one being patents, trade secrets, trademarks and copyright. We can use trade secrets and trademarks too for those things, right? Trevor Yeah, and as uh, someone who really likes liberty and property rights, I have no problems with trademarks and trade secrets. I think it's important for people who care about the philosophy of intellectual property to distinguish those two. Copyrights and patents, purely statute-based, nothing in the common law and Trade secrets and trademarks are pretty much based in common law. I'm pretty happy with those in fact. Trevor Burrus And it's almost like fraud impersonation if you say exactly. – if I walked around saying I am George R. R. Martin uh, and this is my, my – Trevor Or you republish the, his book under your name. Would that be – yeah, that if you would trade, be like fraud trade trademark, trademark name, in they, effect, yeah. trademark. And then with regard to trade secrets, it's you know if if um, you uh, I have you promise not to crack the lock on the digital lock on my work, you promise that, and you do, or you're an employee and you sneak out a copy, you know I should be able to catch you for that under trade secret. I don't think any friend of liberty has a, an objection to that. So uh, to fix it, um, you, you have some few suggestions. Uh, I, I assume you like this 14-year uh, uh, term, uh, renewable possible, and then a few other things to just make it – not do away with it but make it more sensible for human flourishing. What, what are some of your suggestions? Well, the, you know, the step one is the title – what the title of the book suggests is we need to stop regarding it as property. That – it just answers too many questions too easily, especially it, it kind of agrees me to see my friends uh, in support of liberty and property rights. It seems like they see the word property, intellectual property and they stop thinking because they like property. To me, it's a funny thing. It's a little bit like another type of intellectual property. It's a little bit like trademark. Property is like a trademark and what the advocates of intellectual property have done is they're basically infringing on the trademark property. They're taking a word that's a great word <laughs> when it's applied to tangibles and they're overextending it. I expect now people to say, well, tax medallions are property. In fact, the argument has been made with regard to welfare benefits. Said, well, it's a type of property. It deserves 14th Amendment protections. So just reconceiving, that's really my arch goal here is let's just – Take another approach to copyright and see what that shows us and I think it opens our eyes to some other possibilities. All right, a little more concretely, I'd like to see more experimentation which I'm engaged in with the book and as you noted, Creative Commons makes this easier too. I'm a big fan of Creative Commons. Uh, just get a culture where people don't always have to grab everything that they can, <laughs> you know, just to get people to think, you know, maybe you don't need Life of the Author plus 70 because when you do that, buddy, you're kind of taking something away from the rest of us. So why don't you have a big spirit and share a little bit? And what I like about the founder's copyright is it's not saying give everything away. It says out of respect for the founders, for whom I have a great deal of respect, uh, and out of respect for your you know, fellow travelers in this world who might take your work and do something wonderful with it. Why don't you just not be so greedy? You don't have to grab it all. And then there's some specific uh, statutory suggestions, uh, little tweaks to the act which are very subtle. I like to think of them as legal jujitsu. <laughs> now, I don't actually ha- – I'm going to be up on the hill soon talking to lawmakers. I don't actually – don't actually have a lot of faith that they will implement these laws. If they do, it will be in part because they don't realize the subtle long-term effects they might have. <laughs> do you have a Walt Disney mask to wear when you go up there? Because maybe that will help. <laughs> maybe that would help. Um, so there is you know, the prospect of, of, of legislation. And then I guess I would say um, the, 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 the last thing is to keep hoping for technological advances and I have every – uh, you know, uh, reason to think that technology is going to increasingly make copyright just kind of a – not interesting to most people, not relevant. I mean you think about the things we do online every day. We're basically running publication and duplication shops. Every laptop connected to the internet is a massive copying machine and you and me, everybody, every day, we're making lots of copies. Nobody cares. It's just not relevant. Once in a while, somebody will you know, frame some kind of copyright dispute. Most of the time, people kind of you know 
laugh at them. You know, what are you doing? This is not what we do in this place. And I think there's hope as time goes on, people kind of see copyright as an anachronism that maybe applies in a few areas, big Hollywood block- blockbusters, big software projects. But for the rest of us, just nobody cares. It doesn't really, you could use it, but we just don't do that, not culturally. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.